This video contains disturbing imagery as well as discussions around both body horror and body dysmorphia. Viewer discretion advised, and if you don't like any of that, you don't have to watch. I find having a body to be weird on a conceptual level. The idea that all I am, my thoughts, memories, experiences, how I perceive the world, is just a tiny little thing that is housed in this extremely fragile meat sack that can just break at any second. I don't like it. And at risk of getting called political, I am a 20-something year old cisgender man who is in relatively good shape. I am the prime candidate for not minding having a body, and I still find it off-putting. And even beyond just the abject terror of having this very fragile meat shell all the time, there's the fact that most of us don't really like the body we have for some reason or another. It just doesn't live up to what we feel it should be. I guess Skeela was really onto something. A lot of us do wish we were a little bit taller. A lot of us do wish we were ballers. And this idea of your body being fragile, easily mutable, or just something you don't want is played around with so much in horror. But scarier still than the idea that any given Dead by Daylight killer could just destroy your body is the idea that at some point your body will become something other than human and your mind will either be lost with it or, worse, trapped inside a shell it has no control over. This idea is universal in anything that's trying to be even remotely scary. The Cybermen, pretty much everything in Bloodborne, zombies, werewolves, and vampires. And a lot of those things I just mentioned aren't even explicitly from horror media. They're just things that pull upon our primal fear of losing who we are. And I'm not the first person to realize how uncomfortable this is. Kafka wrote an entire book dedicated to the idea, would people still love me if I was a bug? And he answered no. So if you're keen for a bit of body horror, you need to check out these three stories by Junji Ito. He actually has quite a lot of stories about body horror. It's more than just these three, but these are the three I'm talking about so that all that matters for the next, however long this video is. Today, we're going to be talking about the monsters underneath your skin and the body horror of Junji Ito. Spoilers ahead for Den of the Sleep Demon, Slug Girl, and the Enigma of Amagora Fault. Oh! Ew! Dude! What the fuck? I'm going to tell you a secret. I really don't like slugs. I just don't really like anything slug or snail related. They just weird me out. They make me go like, Bleh. Bleh. <laughs> Gross. Ugh. I like Berserk, but I don't like the slug count. I like Uzumaki, but I don't like the snail people. I like Pokemon, but I don't like Slugma. Insert joke here. All of that to say, this story does freak me out, but I do really like it. It's got a lot of very interesting themes crammed into a very short story, and as a result, it's just a thought-provoking piece of body horror. This short is narrated by Rie, who is worried about her friend Yuko. Rie comments that Yuko is usually known for being very chatty, but suddenly she's become very quiet. Seems like she's getting too lazy to talk, and when she speaks it's just weird. Props to whoever localized my scan for perfectly typing out how people with a full mouth talk. She says, Abalfra, I've been unable for food for lately. <laughs> What? That's perfect. That's so good. Alongside the weird speech patterns, Yuko just feels unwell, and eventually this condition means that she can't attend school. When Rie goes over to check on Yuko, she finds her parents in the back garden who are just destroying some slugs. Apparently their back garden has been absolutely infested, and the dad comments that they should bring some salt. Here, Yuko's mother and Rie go to visit Yuko in her room. She is bedbound and wearing a mask. When Rie comments that why is she wearing a mask? She thought this was a mental condition. The doctor said it was all in her head. She's ignored. And then when Yuko's mother goes to check Yuko's mouth, Yuko slaps her hand away and then tells both of them to leave. Slight spoilers from my own analysis of this work later. I do believe this story to be allegorical to mental health alongside many other things. But I think when Rie comments on your mental health being weak, she doesn't mean like a mental health condition. I'm pretty sure she just means it's all in your head. You just feel down. Now, I'd need someone to get the original Japanese and figure it out. It's just the wording of it here. The doctor mentioned your mental health is weak. It's weird to me. It doesn't make sense. A doctor wouldn't say you have weak mental health. 
Anyway, tangent aside, we learn from Rie that Yuko has had a terrifying fear of slugs since elementary school. She just like me, for real. But this is some interesting exposition, and we'll come back to it in a bit. The next day when Rie returns, she finds Yuko's mother in a state of distress, as she's calling out for a doctor, commenting on Yuko's tongue. And then on the next page, we get the iconic slug girl image, this really gross one. <laughs> Ugh. Rie runs away in terror, and this is the last time she sees Yuko. We get the rest of the story still from her perspective, but as things she's heard from Yuko's parents. Every time they cut out the slug tongue, it grows back, and Yuko's dad is force-feeding her salt, which she hates. She's getting thinner and thinner because she can't eat because she has a slug for a tongue, and eventually her parents decide to just bath her in salt. But after literally dunking her in a bathtub full of salt, they find out that Yuko has basically disintegrated. All that remains is her head and the slug tongue. At the very end of the story, it's revealed that she lives out in the garden now. What remains of her is a terrified and sad expression on the back of a slug. So, what was that all about? Before I say anything, I just want to state this is how I read the story, this is what I take away from it, this is not confirmed to be what Junji Ito meant by it, and it's very likely that it was just a weird story about a girl that turns into a slug. That's just as likely as anything else. <laughs> like, I'm not gonna sit here and explain to you why the curtains are blue. <laughs> if you wanna just take it at face value, awesome, man. A lot of people have described this story as being totally Kafka-esque, but I don't really see it. There are some similarities between this and Metamorphosis, but I fundamentally believe them to be about different things. For those who don't know, Kafka's Metamorphosis is a story about a man who wakes up one day and he is a giant bug, and his whole family hate him for it. There's a lot more to it. I will explain some of the more to it, but I recommend you do your own research. There are some similarities here. However, I read Metamorphosis to be a story about how quickly people will turn on you when you are no longer a value to them. You are no longer providing any worth. Gregor's entire family don't hate him because he's a giant bug. They hate him because he used to be their breadwinner and now he can't provide. Again, gross oversimplification of Metamorphosis. Do your own reading. I know I'm going to get comments about this, but I believe there to be a difference because Yuko's family, at least her mother, don't hate her. They're not angry at her for what she is, they're just confused by it, they don't understand it. And it's for that reason I believe this story to be analogous for living with some form of condition, be it mental or physical, but really it could be about anything your family tries to repress, it could be about gender identity, sexuality, just something that your family generally don't understand, the wider world don't like, and something that ultimately is bittersweet to you. There's a lot of hints that point to this, there's the fact that Yuko has been uncomfortable about slugs since a young age, other children would tease her for it, and as soon as her symptoms of, you know, being a slug become visible at school, she's pulled out, she's removed from the eyes of her peers. When Yuko's friend comes to check on her, her parents are destroying slugs, the symbol for her repression, her illness, or whatever you want to believe it is, whatever's closest to home for you. I just say mental illness because that's what's closest to home for me. We see the differing opinions of her parents here, and this is why I commented on the mother earlier. Even this early on, the mother says it's useless killing them, they'll just keep popping up. When we next see Yuko, she is wearing a mask. She is literally covering up her condition. And when it does make its appearance, it forces its way out of her, almost this explosive thing that she's contained. And when she does eventually show this side of herself, her parents' treatment becomes worse, and her only friend leaves her, she abandons her. The end of the story is so sad, because when she does give in and finally show who she is, Yuko is perceived by the wider world to just be a sad face, attached to this horrifying thing. No one really tries to understand it, and all they perceive about her is her illness, or her repression, however you want to read it. Slug Girl is a tragic and lonely story about what it means to be different to everyone else. 
it's really sad. But don't worry, because in this next story, everybody gets in on the body horror. Everyone's invited. Drake? What? Where's the door hole? Holy moly, this story is pretty good. Okay, I'm sorry. I've actually talked about this story before and I explained it in about five seconds. Uh, I'm going to give it a bit more treatment now because I believe it to be the opposite of Slug Girl. My take on this story is probably the most overreaching, pseudo-intellectual, awful take I've ever had. I told another person what I thought this story was about or what I believed it to represent and they just stared at me and then said, huh, that's quite the take. So kind of scared to be putting this out there. You see, whilst I think Slug Girl is about repression, I believe the Enigma of Amagora Fault to be about the dehumanizing nature of chasing your own wholeness above all else. That's a lot. Please hear me out. This story, to me, is basically about main character syndrome. That's a very modern way of describing it, but it's about a bunch of people who abandon their lives, their families, their jobs to go and chase after this idealized thing that they've seen on television or, you know, nowadays they'd see on insert social media app. They believe their hole exists in this mountain and when they insert themselves in it, they cut themselves off from everyone else and then only when it's too late do they realize it's deforming them. Now, there's quite a lot in the story that backs up this interpretation. As I said, there's the fact that a lot of people came here believing themselves to fit in with something they saw on TV. They believe this is their destiny, a higher calling. The fact that they are happy to disregard their lives to do it is evidenced when a character says, tell my mum goodbye before putting himself in the hole. However, it's not a entirely correct or entirely bulletproof interpretation. Characters like Yoshida say that she doesn't want to go into a hole. There's clearly a supernatural psychological element here. She's very afraid of what will happen if she does, but she feels compelled to do it anyway. That said, I do still think that there's room for Yoshida in my interpretation. It's revealed right before she puts herself into a hole, that she has felt alone her entire life. She felt like she had no love from her friends or family, so she was willing to basically jump at the opportunity to feel as though she was the main character, she was the center of the universe, she had this higher calling. No matter how dangerous or scary it is, she still does ultimately give in to it, just because it gives her that sense of security. Awaki, the POV character, has these crazy prophetic dreams that show him the body horror that awaits him in these holes, and he still enters one when he feels he's alone and he's lost Yoshida. He gives in, he romanticizes his sadness and decides, you know what, fine. <laughs> you know, like, there's, there's parallels here. I know I'm gonna get comments. I, I know, <laughs> it's just an interpretation, please. I mean, look at this panel and tell me you've never felt like this after seeing a particularly bad case of main character syndrome, be it online or if you're unfortunate and work around the public like me in real life. So that's why I included this right after Slug Girl and I said it was basically the opposite of it. It's because one is a body horror story used to emphasize the horrors of repression and not understanding yourself, whilst the other is basically the opposite. It's body horror used to represent prioritizing yourself above anything else. Finally, rounding out this triple feature anthology video essay, we have another piece of body horror by Junji Ito. This story, unlike the two before it, I don't really have any hot takes on. I just think it's a pretty fun story. <sighs> Den of the Sleep Demon, sometimes also called Where the Sandman Lives, is just pretty good body horror. I suffered with night terrors a lot as a child, so the idea that your dreams are a malicious entity, yeah, I can believe it. In this story, we follow Yuji and Mari. Yuji is a struggling author in the vein of Alan Wake or any given Stephen King protagonist, and Mari is a girl he likes and hangs out with. When the two are out for coffee, Yuji reveals that he hasn't slept in three days. This is because there's someone inside of his dreams that is trying to get out and swap places with him. That's so weird. <laughs> really cool. Mari brushes Yuji off, 
first believing it to be a story concept he has, and then eventually saying he should just go and see a doctor, at which point he gets up and leaves, because what is a doctor gonna do? Eventually, Mori agrees to go and watch Yuji sleep, if nothing else, just to ease his mind. Personal tangent here. When Mori enters Yuji's apartment, he has a poster hanging up of the Beatles. The Beatles are my favourite band, they're also Junji Ito's favourite band, but I cannot place this image. At first I thought it might be the Rubber Soul cover, but they're not arranged the correct way, and they look a lot more like Magical Mystery Tour era Beatles with the moustaches and John Lennon sideburns. Somebody help me place this, I would like to know what he used as a reference. Mori tapes Yuji up as per a request he makes, but when he falls asleep she cuts the tape and then puts him under a blanket because that's comfier. As a result of this, his hand turns inside out and begins crawling out of his mouth whilst he's asleep. Yuji then has to turn himself back in the right way, like you would with a t-shirt or pair of trousers. He explains this later in the story by saying he believes himself to have been born hollow, or made hollow, when he lost his family. Yuji reveals that he believes the sleep demon is after Mari, because he likes Mari, so he figures the demon does too. Eventually he does fall asleep, and he and Mari are sucked into his dream dimension when he turns inside out. But the story doesn't actually end here, it ends with the police showing up at Yuji's house to look for Mari, where they're greeted by Shadow Yuji. They don't seem to notice that he looks incredibly evil and non-human, and just start interrogating him. Then the story ends in an incredibly funny way, to be honest. The evil version of Yuji immediately implicates himself for Mari's disappearance, saying she is now in his intestines and I have given her a one-way ticket to my dream world. Like, okay, so you went through all that effort to come to the real world to spawn in, listen to the Beatles for like a day, because you haven't left the apartment and that's all that was in there, and then get arrested? Cool. Like, good plan. Well done. Goofy ending aside, I do like this story. I don't consider it as good as, or think about it as often as, Slug Girl or The Enigma of Amagara Fault, or really any number of Junji Ito works, but I wanted to include it here to round off this trilogy of body horror recommendations, because the scenes of Yuji turning inside out are super gross and visceral, and also you can see a lot of artistic growth here from Junji Ito. His work at the point he created this was nowhere near as refined. But even though it's a bit rough around the edges, still a pretty easy recommend from me. So this video was primarily meant to be a trilogy of recommendations and an opportunity to talk more about a few shorter works by a creator that I very much enjoy. But if I had to give a conclusion or a takeaway, it would be that the reason body horror is so prominent across horror circles is because of how malleable it can be. Here we have three stories by the same author that use it to tackle very different subject matters or present it in very different ways. The tropes of body horror are highly universal, they can be used to present a great deal of themes to an audience. I guess the overarching message is that the scope of body horror can encapsulate so much, be it stories of repression, stories of insecurity, to even stories of being very egotistical, or just a weird story where you want to shock and scare your audience by distorting the human form. The uncanny valley is effective for a reason, right? So if you are an aspiring horror content creator who actually creates, you know, original content, <laughs> not like what I do, um, try it out. It usually works for me as an audience member, and that's really all I had to say on the matter. I'm not gonna lie, this video was just an excuse to read stories I liked. <laughs> there is no message. I just wanted to read John Ito. Cool, that's it. See you around. Uh, if you stuck around this long, thanks. That's really cool. Um, hope to see you next time.